106.1 Next Radio. This is the Big Talk. My name is Kanare Mugume. Now, in the realm of journalism, while the pain is mightier than the sword, the fight for press freedom transcends um, everything, including the beats, the specialities, the niches, and whatever you want to call it. But for journalists covering the creative sphere rather than the political arena and current affairs and uh, every day, every day battle uh, takes on a unique um, sort of perspective intertwining uh, with the very essence of expression and innovation in their eyes defending press freedom could in one way or another mean safeguarding the unrestricted flow of ideas stories perspectives whatever they might want to pitch the editor and uh, whatever actually comes out that uh, might eventually fuel artistic endeavors and promote the creatives industry it's about preserving the autonomy to delve into depths of creativity and fluttered uh, by censorship or even its suppression what do we mean by freedom of free uh, freedom of speech and freedom of the press when it comes to covering the creatives we embark on this exploration with uh, uh, the man who has covered uh, this uh, for quite a long time and uh, is very passionate about it, is not even shy to talk about it, and is so opinionated about it. Andrew Kagwa Maiga. Good to have you on the show. Thank you very much. Let me begin by perhaps asking you, what does it mean to cover the creatives? Uh, it, it's a sport. Mm. It, it's a sport. Uh, one thing. So, so, so sports. Uh, uh, S P O T S P O R T. S P O R T. Mm. Uh, one thing people do not know is that uh, one creatives are literally one of the most entitled people. They believe they deserve the space, and they believe they've earned it. Whether they they are just releasing their very first book, their very first song, they believe they've earned that spot. And then they want to be covered the way they want to be covered, not the way you want to cover them. So we basically deal with a group of very many dictators. When you like, I'm one of those people that have been stopped from entering a show, not even when I am asking for a complimentary, when I'm trying to pay for my ticket. And someone tells you, ah, the director has told us not to sell us tickets, not to sell tickets to you. So that's how it gets with, with the creative industry. And then it's not even just the artists. Like, this is a field that's really underlooked. So everyone believes they have an opinion when it comes to the creative industry. So at times you're going to find the questions coming from the people that are supposed to back you, like your bosses. So let's say a beer brand has sponsored an artist and you have a different opinion about the show and how it went down but because probably the beer brand that sponsored also advertises with the media house and at that point all your opinions about that show have to be thrown in the bin and you need to develop a new opinion about the show so it's actually a sport what are the creatives Sometimes we have to remind people every Friday <laughs> what the creatives are. <laughs> okay. Uh, what, what are the creatives? Creatives are... A creative and, and, and what is your journey like covering the creatives? A, a creative is any person that creates. You could be a writer, you could be a singer. Of course, singers still work with writers. You could be an instrumentalist. Like, if you create something out of nothing, be it a painting, you're, you're creative. Uh, my journey covering them, one, these are people that always ask you, what have you done before you start talking about us? Uh, personally, I've been very lucky that my work ended up speaking for me. Uh, and that's because, not because I was very well trained when I was getting in, but I grew up around the industry like my brother is an actor so he used to dump me in the theater when he had rehearsals so i could see everything so by the time i got into the field i knew what a good theater show looks like or what a good theater play looks like so when i was writing about people and they were getting mad they would read the stories and then they would come to the observer then and they would ask you how did you get to know what you know because they were used to people covering them when at times they do not really understand what they were doing. 
so my chance of experiencing the creative industry before I became a journalist kind of helped me when I was coming in and it's one of the things that at, at, at times has helped me stand out but then it has also worked against me because again like I said that they are very small dictators mm. when they notice someone knows what they are talking about they want to distance themselves away from you right uh, do you regret having been a journalist that covers the creatives or you, when you look at your colleagues at uh, the newsroom you feel like you know I should be one of those running around um, covering the politics of the day funny thing is my very first story was about a, a radiotherapy machine that had broken down so how I got into the observer was a very long and funny story someone landed on my blog post and they thought I was good that was Richard Kavuma and then he reached out and when he reached out I uh, came through and he asked me if I was attached to any media house and then I was like no and then he wanted me to start writing for the observer the very first assignment he gave me was of a radiotherapy machine that had broken down at Mulago so I went I observed asked people questions and then wrote a story I even talked to the PR at that time so I had a lot of opinions in there because of what I had seen and then I was told you cannot do this for news uh, you need to get inside of the story the people you've talked to and you kind of kind of somehow leave it at that without throwing in a lot of your opinions now since I was already conversant with the arts I just decided to pick the arts over current affairs because I felt there were more chances of expressing when it comes to the arts but again there was also a gap because at that time we had very many people that were telling us what happened at the concert not what did not work and why it didn't work so personally at the time when I was starting I was mainly looking at telling people what did not work and why it did not work as opposed to telling people he came on stage at this time he sang these songs because I believed people would find that on social media even before the concert ends if I regret I don't the only thing I think I regret is that um, I think Uganda is not really ready for arts journalism at the professional level so when it comes to art and creativity we mostly consume the lifestyle part of it uh, we prefer people covering to concerts and you know writing yes. about what happened over the weekend and yes. then we stop there and uh, even when we are talking about these things for example if Bebe Cool releases a new album most Ugandans will prefer to talk about the money he spent on the album and how expensive the videos are or the cars he put in the video than the actual music of the album so we always go for the cars so and so has a new car so and so has a new house we prefer that to talking about the actual art what I want to understand is uh, with your journey covering um, the creatives as a journalist covering this specific do do domain mm -hmm. how do you perceive the concept of uh, press freedom one you see one one of the things I hate about the concept of press freedom and journalists and that's not even just the create covering the creatives but all of us journalists is that uh, when we talk about it most of the times we look at it in the ways of people making it so hard for us to get information or making it so hard for us to do our jobs and uh, most of the times when we are talking we talk about the arms of the government we could talk about the police we could talk about like most of the times we end up talking about the arms of the government but trust me like press freedom at times is mostly suppressed in our newsrooms like when it comes that, that, to that's, that's an important thing that you have to <laughs> <laughs> you know this yeah yeah uh, yeah. Uh, yeah you talk about it go on <laughs> so so like there are very many things at times we do we end up not saying mainly because 
a boss somewhere and one of the people you're supposed to be reporting to doesn't want it to be said but then even when it comes to us like you see it's very easy for us to go out and um and talk about nurses and their mega salaries and you, you know where i'm going now it's easy for us to talk about nurses and their mega salaries it is very hard for journalists to even talk about the bad contracts they have so, or even lack of them <laughs> or even the lack of the contracts yeah so so i get a problem every time this day happens because we usually have a lot of celebrations and people keep talking about the same things and you're thinking but the people that are abusing journalists rights are at times are the people that are talking they are the bosses mm. so for me i have a problem with the concept of press freedom with the way we perceive it okay let's take a break when we return uh where i sit mm. when i'm covering politics and current affairs um mind you even the creatives can be current affairs like yeah, when yeah. they decide to go and get some uh, billions of shillings from state house <laughs> but that's a story of another day yeah. where i sit from the corner of politics press freedom might mean what happens when i go to the field what happens when the story returns and it's about a certain personality in mm -hmm. the government and uh, and how it's treated but i want to know how different it is for the no uh, notion of uh, press freedom and how mm, it does manifest differently in uh, the world of creatives. Big Talk returns shortly. 106.1 Next Radio, this is the Big Talk and uh, we are looking into the world of creatives, particularly celebrating today the World Press Freedom Day uh, through the eyes of a journalist who covers the creatives. Andrew uh, Maiga and uh, he's here with us He's a journalist who has been covering this for quite some time Andrew d does it manifest differently uh, if you're covering the creatives I mean press freedom most of the times it looks like we have access uh, we have access the only dangers is that uh, you know that situation why where the person who is giving you information is the person in charge of the access things become very tricky so the way the creative creative journalism works is um most of us most journalists are not facilitated by media houses to cover things like concerts theater shows so they usually depend on the sponsors of the shows one by being invited by the sponsor you're already compromised in a certain way because it means the sponsor will choose when to invite you for the next one or not to invite you and just deal with someone else because they are easier to work with what happens when they don't invite you does that mean that uh, you're going to run out of content on I've the actually, next concert i've actually been one of those people that have paid for very many concerts out of my pockets that's why the story i told you uh, but andrew go catch you go wow one no boy okay, i gotta call a show i will tell you mm. one of the things that has uh the good things that have happened to me when i'm covering the arts is i've gotten the attention of very many arts publishers some of whom are out of uganda so when it's a theater show for instance or when it's a concert there are people beyond uganda that are interested in our content so it is not a big deal for me to pay for myself because i'm doing a story for a magazine out there and they're actually going to pay well so that's the reason why most of the times i'm ready to pay for myself at times even before someone asks for that story out there i'll go and do and try to cover it and then try to pitch it but like i told you there are times you will go and they will tell you we were instructed not to sell you tickets why why would that be the case uh you probably wrote a tough story in your previous edition yes uh I've, personally i've written a tough story about literally about everyone because as a creative bad days are very normal and uh i think it's the problem with with covering the arts most of things like theater for instance i will tell you that when you come to theater for the opening show 
there are chances that the actors will be bad because it's the opening, they, they are still nervous and everything, and then they'll become better as it goes. But yeah, but you know that so bad days always happen. So bad days always happen. Why do you go ahead and unfortunately uh, write a critique? Most of the, of the people that organize theater shows organize the first show as the press show. Like they expect you to review basing on that. And on my side, I'm expecting you guys to be ready because you had about three months to rehearse. You had about uh, five to six tech rehearsals. Like, I expect you to be good. So when I come in and it's not good, there are chances that I'll give you a bad review. Which review would have been better if I actually came into, if you guys were doing, like, the third show? It would have been a better review, but just that you have your press show as the very first show, chances are you're going to have a bad review. So when you give people a bad review, they try to avoid you. It's something creatives do. They try to avoid you and then they will try to work with someone who does not understand a lot about the industry so that someone can, one, give them a, not a review, just a report of this thing happened. If there was a politician that gave a speech, much of the story is about the politician and artists don't really care of which kind of story they usually get as long as it's not pointing, putting them in the bad light. As long as their name is just out there. Yeah, as oh. long as the name is out there. Has uh, the restriction about the things that you should cover um, independently as a journalist, those restrictions, have they impacted you, uh, your journalism, your career, and in the bigger picture, the entire creative industry in any way? If there are any examples you can even cite. Um, when... Of course, I, I, I don't know if you've heard of the V monologues. It happened those days when we were in school. So when I joined journalism, someone staged the V monologues at one of the culture centers. And uh, I went for the show. Like I thought it was an amazing show. If you ask me right now, I'll still tell you it was an amazing show. But then there came the danger of publishing the show the, the the story reviewing the show like i really hoped that story because as a freelancer you give your story to your editor if they do not want it you try to give it to someone else at the end of it all since at that time i did not have enough connections that story is still somewhere on my laptop because no one was ready to publish it and then there was another show where we had to have a very long talk with my editor before it got published it was um, a friend's production it's called uh, just me myself and the silence it's about i think the show was written in 2008 when uganda was trying to sign the very first anti-gay bill so it follows this misunderstood boy who people try to beat because they think he's gay and then it turns out that the rightful brother of his who was even a church leader was actually the gay one that that review that review struggled to find space but it was about a lot in, of in the local audience yes in mm. the local audience it mm. struggled to find space and because I was trying to tell my editors, this is actually not promoting. It's trying to understand this in a just a different context. It eventually got space. And uh, I remember when it got space, it was later adapted by, I think, The Guardian. But just the mere fact that the conversation had to happen, like, for, for me, just showed me, like, even when we are communicating, there are things we cannot just say, yeah. All right, uh, what I also want to understand, Andrew, from your own perspective, and uh, you've told us some of the instances that you've encountered uh, when you're covering some of the arts and, and the resistance you've also met. But from your perspective, what role does media play in shaping the societal attitudes towards uh, uh, the, the creatives, for example, the example you just cited? One, that, that review. One, the media, the media speaks directly to the people. For example, what you're doing here, 
is being listened to even people that are driving and most importantly the mid, mid, this kind of media because uh, you see when it comes to tv someone has to like put their attention on tv when it's radio they, they can't do anything else. they can't do anything else when it comes to radio people can be doing all these other things when they are listening like we shape perception like there are people like in today in today's world you know there are people that will still call in a sports show and they want to know if if Saka is going to start an Arsenal game and yet you're thinking they have a smartphone the one they've used to call they can just google and find but they believe when it's said by the radio presenter then it's right so we have a lot of power when it comes to the things we say like for some people it is the gospel truth now when it comes to the creative industry we can choose for people what to focus on we are the people that made people focus on the lifestyle of the people like everything artists are doing today why they do not care very much about their music but they care about the house the new dress and everything are things we started when we taunted baby cool for not having a house and renting we were shaping what we have today so when we shaped that and were successful with that every artist that came after that started focusing on that and very very less about the music so the media is quite powerful when it comes to one shaping the way people see mm. the industry the way people consume music and the kind of music they end up consuming so sometimes it can be dangerous uh, shaping harmful um stereotypes shaping harmful narratives very much and, and, and i think we've we've kind of done that here yeah, yeah. And, and you've been successful at it <laughs> successful at even some of the wrong things i found that, it that, yeah that, that it wasn't it, it wasn't <laughs> deliberate but you got to a point where like oh okay this is what we've created it's a monster yeah. that is going to live within us true true and okay i don't really know how we got there because if it had happened now i could easily explain that uh one the creative industry looks like the easiest one to get in when it comes to journalism like people believe you do not even need to know much like i'll tell you a story when when i joined observe and i had been there for a year i was given an intern so okay i was very lucky that i joined the media and then i go to travel a lot because we did not have very many people that were writing about some kind of arts uh theater visual art dance we had very few people that were writing about them they are still very few even now so i managed to travel a lot in a very short time i did very many shows like tv shows and when people see you on tv they kind of feel like they want to be that so what happened is i was given an intern and this intern specifically asked for me asked to work with me so there was a baby cool show at the time she was there so i told her we shall be covering a baby cool show next month but i would want us to go and attend his rehearsals to see his process such that by the time we get to cover the show like we are more informed about his process we have a lot to write about her story comes out different so i took her for one of his rehearsals and she got bored she went and asked my bosses to to give her another field to cover because i was making entertainment boring so so we have very many people that come in and they are coming in for the picture they saw me share when i was at a festival and and probably they think that's what this is all about and because of that we have very many people that will end up in here and they do not know a simple thing but as long as they have a phone and they can ask a weird question for them that's it have you had any uh, instances in your career where you've uh, attempted to cross paths that you shouldn't or that many people think that you shouldn't even though it is within your right as a journalist uh, they like, uh, uh, like, sure like, like sorry you, you you can't do this you can't write this 
this one is untouchable you can't attend such a, a concert you can't attend such a festival so be like you know what I, i'm sorry but i'm gonna go ahead and do this so there was a time i don't know if you've had you had the stories when there was that conversation that someone is trying to take over national theater yes yes i i, I had that so we covered many of those stories and um we did a couple of stories around that we collected voices from many people and so one of the times when the ministry was trying to address those one they started by not inviting me for pressers so and one they had pressers on weird days like someone calls for a press on sunday and if you are at home and someone calls you and is like have you heard of the press happening at the national theater and you're like no what is it about they tell you about it and you're thinking i i should actually be there because i'm following this story so the national theater saga was quite a weird one uh not being invited for pressers or people telling you what would you do if you sh if what would they do if you showed up of course nothing Mm. The, but, the but you'd rather not be part of the uh, pull and, and push the only thing is that uh, when someone tells you that it's going on and uh, you're somewhere in Gaza ah, it becomes you're, you're, you're thinking of like, should I it? is mm. it worth it so like I miss many of that when it came to to that story but we still did some stories and I believe we still saved <laughs> that place I don't know for how long but at that time we we still served it i recently had a conversation we actually the, the last conversation last week on friday uh, on the big talk here on the creatives we had a conversation with um huntington bujingo mm -hmm. and and he was so optimistic and and so hopeful that uh, now that they have artists mm -hmm. on the board of the trustees of the uncc uh, which is also mandated to create structures like the National Theatre or Normal mm -hmm. Gallery and the others, mm -hmm. that uh, perhaps they can create some changes. Is, is there hope in you that perhaps there's a difference uh, that, that, that these new, newly sworn in board members can do? Uh, if the new members are not talking about policy change, there is very little hope. And for me, one of the things I'm interested in, more so when it comes to the National Theatre, is people noticing that it's not a place, that it's an institution. Just imagine if UCC was existing as a place on in Bugolovi. Google, in Bugolovi. Like, that would be a very dangerous thing. Like, National Theatre is supposed to be like the UCC of the creatives. They are supposed to exist in Gulu. We're supposed to find some sort of a community centre in Gulu. Uh, in Wakiso. So if at the moment we are still seeing it existing as a place, it's a and very and dangerous situation. It's very yeah. problematic. Yeah. Yeah. And, and for you, what was uh, very passionate uh, to cover about uh, the takeover of the National Theatre? Was it the fact that it will no longer exist? Was it the uh, eventually diminishing creative industry? What, what was it for Actually, at that, at that time, it wasn't about that. Because uh, I believe creativity and expression can happen from everywhere. But uh, one of the things you need to be looking at, Canary, is the fact that uh, Uganda as a country and then Kampala as a city do not have character. Uh, everything that's attached to our, to our history has literally been torn down and replaced with a newer building. That if someone left Uganda in 2007 and they came back today in 2024, they would not notice Kampala. They would not notice the Kampala they had. And yet we keep spending a lot of money to go to Zanzibar to see, say, that fort, the, the fort where they used to keep slaves. We keep going to Mombasa to see Fort Jesus. The main reason why these places keep attracting people is because they have a lot of history and they've been maintained and no one is tearing them down for newer things. The more you keep them there, the more stories you keep. Because, for example, when you think about National Theatre, even before you think of people performing from there, like the very first black man to do a play in Uganda and stage it in a professional theatre was at the National Theatre, and that was Wycliffe Chienji. 
uh, when you add in stories of Byron Kawadwa being taken from there, like it has a very rich history that when you tear it, even the architecture of it, which is a piano shaped, and the stories behind it, how artists came together, kind of collected money and got more from the British to buy the place. Like when you tear it down, you're not just tearing down bricks and and marble, you're tearing down the history of Ugandan art and whatever you put there people will not have an attachment to it the way they have an attachment to this. So for me at that time, it wasn't even of artists losing a performing space because the proposal said they were going to build a bigger one. Uh, they were going to give people more theatres. But you know how promises in this country have gone down. Yes, <laughs> there is that. But the, for me, the fact, the factor of history, because think about it, there was once a school called Shemoni, and it was right next to the National Theatre. If you imagine, that school has very many hobbies that when they are, it's like their stories were erased when someone raised it and put there what we have at the moment. So for me, it was all about just maintaining that part of heritage, which we do not do very well in Uganda. Right. So preserving culture and heritage. Preserving culture and heritage. Let's take a break when we return. What are the moving trends when it comes to the creatives industry? And uh, how does a journalist like Andrew um, intend to cover them? 106.1 Next Radio, this is the Big Talk. And uh, we are looking at uh, and trying to understand the mobile money rules. Withdrawing uh, more uh, uh, 1 million and, uh, shillings and above, you're going to be required to present your identification that is going to be noted down by the mobile money agent, and that is a rule uh, that does exist in our laws. In the studios to discuss this and its implications, I'm joined by Andrew Kawere, who is a Deputy Director of National Payment Systems at the Bank of Uganda, and a commercial lawyer, Louis Chizito. Um, Louis, do you see this being implemented uh, successfully? Do you see it achieving its objective of uh, curbing fraud? No. <laughs> and I, I know it will be implemented successfully. Whether it will mitigate fraud, no. I'm actually going to tell Andrew, no. Let me, I've just told you. You see, there's a slippery slope. He has just said that you can go and withdraw 500,000 shillings here, then maybe after three minutes you go to another engine and, you do and then maybe you can get a block on a third incident. You see, the thing is, eh, the data sets, once, data protection, I don't even know if this guy did data protection assessment. Okay, maybe that is supposed to be done by the personal data protection office. But again, they're supposed to share the data with them. If my data is already with a controller somewhere, a data controller somewhere, eh, and then you're going to extend it to one agent under the agent principal relation. Then you only hold the, the, the principal accountable. The data sets, you're actually killing that chain. You're actually introducing new, uh, new people who, for me, my biggest worry is how those agents use our data. Let me give you an example. Under our laws, it is illegal to sell my personal data. But if I know that Louis keeps withdrawing money from X agent, I can say, okay, I want to hack Louis. He's always going that person. That lady should have the data. Let me give her 5,000 shillings, and then she'll give me the name. And then before you know it, social engineering. You see, I have been a victim of social engineering hacks before. Well, not successfully, but I have. Someone calls you. Recently, I had an incident. There's a friend. I used to go entirely because I was entire school in Elev. There's a friend of mine who used to be entire schoolmates. So I get a call. Louis, I am stranded. I am in much India here. I need 100,000. Otherwise, I am going to be in... A, Policia. So I rush, I actually first call the guy, Louis. Uh, I call the real guy, because the guy told me he had lost his number. So I call the other original number. The guy tells me, Louis, I've not called you. Who is that? So I call back and ask this guy. Okay, I pretend maybe he's the guy I know. I ask the guy, how did you know me? How did you get my details? Unfortunately, because of, I think I had made a lap somewhere on my WhatsApp group. Well, the guy got the information, called me pretending to be someone he knows. And how did he get that data? Through a third party. You get this thing of data protection, I think th there should be a, there should be a bigger discussion with the personal data protection office, and that's why I'm saying eh, the training of these people or the agents has to go even way beyond the payment law that we're talking about. It has to go into data because the biggest risk with this is data, and like I've told you, social engineering. Can someone can call you and say, "I am from your village, 
And somehow you might think that because the person knows you, he has given you, first of all, he has got your name, he knows your name, he knows where, he knows your age, he, he even knows your education levels. That basic information can make someone talk to you and make you feel he knows you. And before you know it, you are all losing money. So for me, I'm thinking it's a good idea. It might be implemented well because we, we, they have no choice. But I think awareness should not be only the cost of the licensed players. We should also say the central bank. I think the next budget they're justifying. I think the budget framework is ongoing. They should now justify and say, guys, we're going to roll out this and maybe we need information. We need to well, educate. Not even only the... Because they say they don't deal with agents. And I, I really agree with them. But what are they but, going to do? But they're the ones that are actually going to going enforce to collect this. the data. Mm. So me, I, and, and I'm actually trying to think that maybe they should talk to the data person, data protection office. The data, and I, I, I've actually already mentioned, Canary, that we've uh, had uh, engagements with the personal data protection office. And they, are, they also have you know, certain initiatives that they, they've already laid out because they have the, 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 the legal responsibility for enforcing data protection. But I hear you, the central bank is indeed going out on awareness and uh, uh, personal data protection is, is one of the top priorities that, that, that you know, uh, is, is, uh, for, for which outreach is, is, is actually going to be conducted. Mm -hmm. And the Data Protection Office is uh, uh, on board. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. I, I, that's, but let me conclude by saying, the thing is, it will be implemented because we have no choice. But then let us not be also very bad with our, with our, with our, with their implementation. You can't say that, Louis. If you go and you do 200,000 shillings here, 300,000 shillings here, 400,000 shillings there, just as a way of bypassing the regulation, you can be blocked. How sure are you that I will not be having three emergencies in one hour? You get? Hmm. So, it, it's, it's quite tricky. It's tricky. Um, Andrew, what, what, as we conclude this conversation, um, when we did a survey today, the whole of today, we did a survey downtown in many parts of Kampala, we found out there's actually not anyone that was enforcing this. Some of the people we spoke to, they said that one, they were not aware, despite receiving the message, they weren't even sure that it was from their um, mobile money um, companies, the, the ones that provide that service. That is number one. Number two, those who understood that somehow literate, those who understood the message, they weren't sure whether they should start enforcing because with or without enforcing, transactions were taking place. How are you going to go about all this? Yeah, like I said, uh the, 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 the central bank is, is going out to create awareness. And uh, uh, for, for some, this is already happening because we, we, we have some information from uh, some, some circles as well. For others, like you've said, yes, some you know, have, do not have full information. Some think it may not be true. Others have not started enforcing it. But we know that ultimately, uh, this is uh, the direction that the country is taking. This is the direction that the central bank has, uh, has proposed. And uh, we encourage the public to embrace this because it is uh, for the good of everyone. Uh, a clean financial system is good for all of us. Nobody wants to go back on to the fatty uh, gray list. And uh, nobody wants to lose their hard-earned money. We want to consolidate the gains that have been, uh, you know, so uh, uh, much registered uh, in terms of mobile money growth. And, and so let's deal with these bad apples you know, by uh, a balancing between the convenience and, and the integrity of the system. And we feel that the threshold of one million is, is you know, good enough to, to accommodate uh, the majority of Ugandans. Right. Like I said, this is about 98% of the transaction count. And so we encourage Ugandans to embrace this. We encourage Ugandans to update their details, get your national IDs. If you've lost a national ID, notify the police, notify NIRA, get an, uh, an, uh, a letter that, that certifies your, your details pending issuance of one, and let's you know, identify ourselves for the large ticket transactions. That is our message to the public. Just to be clear, the 98% is on the value, is on the count? Is on the count. On the count. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. I want to remind the listeners that enjoy fresh vibes and pola pola with Bell Lager. It's expertly brewed, perfectly balanced, and has an undeniably refreshing taste. Grab a bell lager at recommended retail prices at only two, 3,200 shillings today and make your golden moments unforgettable. Bell lager, the official beer for enjoyments. Excessive consumption of alcohol is harmful to your health. Please drink responsibly, not for sale to persons under the age of 18. Also, uh, grab 20 pieces of the chicken lollipop at Cafe Sofrito at only 99,000. 
Cafe Sofrito located in Komamboga. You can reach them at uh, 0743-166-075. And every Friday, like tomorrow, it's TGI Fridays with the Jonesy Band at the Emin Pasha Hotel and Spa City Blue Collection. Grab a barbecue plant at 6,000 and a local beer bucket of four at 36,000. TJF Fridays with Janzi Band at Emin Pasha. Louis, you have the last word on the show. I'm going to go a little bit off topic, but we still didn't know what we're discussing. And I'm also going to give him a minute to respond. You see, the biggest concern has been, and from us lawyers, what you see, the biggest concern of the Omuntu Wawansi in the second market is Louis, when I die, what happens to my money? Of course, you tell him what they tell us to tell the, the, our clients. You go through the legal process, uh, because the law says legal representative, in case Louis dies today, God forbid. Then they have, they, they have to go and someone has to get certificate, uh, letters of administration or maybe letters of probate through, uh, under the office of the administrator general or maybe the process and the courts, courts award them. Now the question is, if Louis has nothing and all he has is 200,000 shillings, will it be worth, and we all know how lengthy the, progress, the process is. So for me, I think they should come up with regulations now to handle unclaimed financial assets. You get it's a bit off topic, but scam time of feedback. So please find a way of coming up with because we have it is possible that after seven years, our money will go to the consolidated fund because, well, some of these processes are very debated. You know, there are people who have co wives and they cannot agree, so you can even take some time to get letters of administration. So that is just an off topic thing. So, a regulation lo should look how should it look like in terms of uh, if they verify that so and so has died and had uh, a balance on mobile money should directly go to their next of kin. The next of kin thing, no, the law says legal representative. Eh? Mm. So that means that you have to go through the formal process of getting four letters of administration so that someone manages your estate. So, so how should it look like? Personally, you're saying I think, the current is... Uh, okay, I, I, think the, 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 I think there should be actually thresholds. Eh? Okay, we shouldn't, again, contravene the law. But, but Louis, you are a lawyer. <laughs> if, if, if someone passes away, there, there has to be a, a process. No, no, not evidence. There has to be a process through which their estate is managed. And there is no way you can say, I mean, create thresholds or what, because at the end of the day, irrespective of the value, there has to be a standardized process through which that estate is managed. And currently, uh, for purposes of mobile money, that is clear in the law. It is legal. It is very clear. But from what mm. I'm asking for yeah. is mm. the process of, in case, how, how the timelines when I should go to the... To no, but, the... but you, see, you see, how different will it be if I had a small plot of land, a small chimanja? You know, but it, but it, is, it has to be the same thing. But for a mm. small plot of land, mm. someone can say, well, that is money, the value, but you have 300,000 shares. No, that, that plot of land, don't look at it in terms of uh, value. the monetary value. You look at the, the possession, even if it is uh, my, my coat, my, my jacket, my suit. Mm. So the, the, the process of managing a deceased estate should, should be standard, and that should be a bit different for, for financial. But then also, also mm. before even leave a deceased person, this entire thing of nine months, seven months, then your money goes, the account is a little bit blocked, then the money, I think that, that process again needs to be streamlined through regulation. Yeah? The regulations are clear. Mm. If, sure. if, 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 if your mobile money account is dormant for nine months, mm. it will be suspended and you will be notified prior to that. That account will be suspended for another six months within which you can reactivate it. If you don't show up within six months, then that account is going to be locked. Now that is 15 months of zero activity on that account. And even when it is locked, the central bank receives that money as a custodian. And you have another seven full years to come and claim it. If you claim the money, if you show up, you get the money. And every day we pay people. People come and make those claims. Of course, you make the claim through uh, your service provider. Mm. And, and I don't th see anything wrong with that process because you have 15 months within which to create some activity on your mobile money account. For me, what I'm saying... Or to go and, and as show going up the service provider. I think you should make some more detailed regulation on how managing and claim financial assets so that that process is in the law can be ably implemented and given a bit some, okay, some soft guidelines on how telecos should approach it along the timelines. I, 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 I don't think it's, I don't think it's in their interest to make it as soft as possible <laughs> because the process can also be manipulated. Gentlemen, thank you very much for honoring our invitation to be with us here on the Big Talk. Check. 106.1 Next Radio, this is the Big Talk on to our last segment of the show. In the studios uh, tonight, I'm hosting uh, Andrew Maigakagwa. And uh, we're talking the creatives industry and what it means to um, push the barriers of press freedom uh, in a career like his. Andrew, um, 
you, you've had to, for example, um, be able to balance uh, the integrity of some of the artists that you've covered vis-a-vis uh, -vis what you're supposed to do as a professional journalist. And, you know, for example, you, this person is talented, you feel like uh, you should uh, put and promote their work. But at the same time, what they're doing, you feel like is bringing down the industry. How are you able to strike a balance between the two? Uh, one, I think one of the biggest problems we have with that is, uh, is that at times they look at media as a promoter instead of an enabler. An enabler. Mm. So I usually tell myself, I'm here to inform people. I'm here to tell people about what's out there. Though I can't deny that there are some amazing artists I've had, and I've literally taken their music and tried to put it on radio stations if I have friends there. When I was getting into the media, Ken was getting into music. I think he had just left the competition he was in, Kenneth uh, Mugabe. Oh, Kenneth Mugabe, okay. And the moment I listened to his music, I felt like everyone has to listen to his music. You felt like it was upon you, it was your responsibility, you were obliged. I felt like push everyone has to listen his to talent. his music mm. because it was different and it wasn't just him it was ken it was a free it was a pure moral like these people were amazing and they were different mm. so i did try to push even without talking to them because i was still trying to protect that relationship like i don't want to get to that level where the artist thinks you're the manager so i did that even without talking to them so at times they were just told like oh Someone actually brought your music here. So, at what point do you strike a balance between um, uh, protecting uh, your audience or mm -hmm. your readers uh, and, and the people that look at your content uh, from your own personal biases? And, and bias could be positive that, mm -hmm. that you fell in love with, 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 with um, uh, perhaps someone who is. Um, doing music but not necessarily that's not how the mm -hmm. crowd mm -hmm. feels about mm -hmm. it. how yeah. do you protect them from what you're supposed to do as a journalist which is inform and mm -hmm. let the audience do their own judgment and vis-a-vis uh, -vis when you try to impose perhaps your own personal biases on the audience uh one interesting things about uh art journalism or the creative economy is that it's very okay to be biased i mean this that's kind new this, <laughs> uh, actually I, that's what i think is very <laughs> uh incredible about the creatives i yeah. can't say the same for me with I, I know politics. i i know mm. i mean policy is policy uh the law is the law uh when it comes to creative creatives and the way we talk about them like what you think about a song is not what i would think about the song but I believe what you say about this song as long as you can defend why you think the way you think about it. So that's the, that's the subjective nature of what we do, is that I will tell you Kenneth Mugabe's music is good and you will tell me it's bad as long as you can defend why you say it's bad. So I'm usually very okay when I'm biased because I can defend my biases. The problem would be me failing to defend why I'm biased towards a certain artist. So every time I can defend my bias, I'm, I'm very okay with it. So as a journalist, I do not really have to be objective. Like art, creativity has never been objective. Like we can even see the same show. Like I can see a show today and I will say very good things about it. If that show is staging again tomorrow, I will say bad things about it, maybe because yeah. of the context. Mm. Uh, I'll give you an example of a show like um, Hamilton, uh, about the founding fathers of the US. Very popular because everywhere it goes, people understand it. Uh, when Hamilton came out in 2015, it made a lot of sense. When Hamilton started showing after Obama and then at that time they had Trump now it was different uh, people now started looking at it as as uh, dancing slave owners when it came out the very first time people did not look at 
the characters as dancing slave owners. And then lines like immigrants who get the job done would get more screams from people because Trump was technically against immigrants and everything. So the time you're watching at can usually shape your perspective about it. Like art is never written in stone the way we cover it is never written in stone which i don't think i can say is the same thing with politics with politics if if it's the law like that's the law and i can tell you in politics the more uh things change the more they remain the same uh, <laughs> yeah the, 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 the cycle is always the same okay what we also want to understand is uh, are there any uh, trends that you've been observing over time that you think perhaps this is where we'll be in five years in the creatives industry yeah for specifically uganda creative creative industry and uh, and the journalism as well uh, one with the creative industry uganda is going to have a lot of uh, fake artists, as in people that do not think, uh, because we are failing to find a regulation around AI. I, I, again, well, I only respect your opinion of being uh, extremely subjective and, and you're not apologetic about it. But when you say fake artists, so how do you know who sings and who doesn't? Now that will be the problem. I do not mean fake because they are singing badly, but fake because we do not even know that they are singing. Like, you could decide to become an artist without going to the microphone yeah, any I mean, day. Before the show, I googled some lyrics about uh, the show, but just create like a rap theme. And guess what? I had the lyrics in just less than <laughs> two seconds. You see, so I'm thinking in the next few years we're but going to But does it have... matter? Yes, it does. Uh, what makes this what make, what makes art and the creative industry special is expression uh, the way you say those words the way and where they came from when you're writing them is what makes it special uh, when we get to that point where we do not even know if the person sang like that's a danger and it will bite into into the revenue of the people that that dedicated their life to being actually creatives and then when it comes to the journalism we are going to become extinct as people that write a lot about the industry because the more we go on developing is the more people are reading less and they are watching more so probably as we go on you might find some of us turning into video content creators as opposed to writing Right. Uh, do you see content uh, a lot more shifting from uh, perhaps people reading your content uh, via text to you recording a video and giving an opinion in two minutes as opposed to writing a 1,000 word article? I think we are almost there. We are almost there. Like, it's just that some of us are still insisting on writing because we love it. But uh, today, people will listen and watch people that have opinions more than reading what they have to say. So we are almost halfway there. That's, that's the reason why we have very many YouTube channels. Literally everyone who is starting a YouTube channel is starting one about entertainment. Yeah. Like I said earlier, they feel like that's the place where they can easily get into. I mean, if I can do seven hours of TikTok in a week, mm -hmm. when I look at um, my phone and I've done seven hours of yeah. TikTok in a week, it also means that um, I probably will not spend... Um, I actually don't think we are going to, 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 to be there. Really I don't think we are going to be there in five years. We might be there in two. Mm. Yeah. Or even next year will actually be different. Or even next year. Uh, knowing that it's an election year. All right, Andrew, as, as we conclude the conversation, what I want to understand from you is that um, uh, what, what, how do you handle criticism and backlash from individuals, organizations within the creative sector regarding your reporting? <laughs> one i'm very okay with criticism like if you're dishing it you should be able to take it uh i've criticized very many artists very many organizations and i'm always ready when they turn the guns to me and trust me there are very many times i've been wrong about things like yeah. very many times do you go back and apologize or like you know i'm the one who wrote about you so i can't apologize i apologize i think even like like a month back i apologized but that that time it wasn't of something wrong it was about um 
I think it was about a picture that had been used. Like Ayori is, Amori is ready to apologize because we are human. Uh, of course, that mistake will follow you. Like the next time you say something right, and they'll bring back. Like the other time you did this, yeah, but but it's okay. That's that's what being human is about. So, like I do not take it bad when someone criticizes my work, or when someone says I got something wrong. Like I'm always ready to double check. Okay, criticism is different. Perhaps it's about genuine feedback about your work. But what about backlash? Backlash. So that that guy with the dreadlocks thinks he can write <laughs> about anything. Yeah. Ah, jeez. Like I think one of the. I worst... see a lot on your on your Twitter. Things. Yes. And, yes. Uh, and I wonder. At times you just read through it. Uh, you will make it worse when you try to explain it. Sometimes people are not willing to understand. Yeah, but does it affect you in terms of your future writing? You are a little more conscious on, on how you pro uh, try to uh, protect some individuals. You are uh, much more sensitive in the kind of language that you use. I think if it's right, I will not care. If it's right, I'll put it out there for the world to see. But uh, one of the things you need to remember, like I said earlier, is the the dangers before us or the blockades before us at times are not just the people. At times they are the people we work with or the people that employ us. As long as you're still working for people and you're communicating, at times you'll, you'll be forced to write according to what they think. If they think it's a no-go area, you will not go there. Probably you'll end up putting it on your social media. Mm. But again, these days there are social media policies. Yeah, so we can. <laughs> <I guess. laughs> All right, Andrew, on uh, this uh, World Press uh, Freedom Day, you have the last word on the show. Uh, one. I think my last word would actually will actually go out to the media houses. Uganda has one of the youngest populations out there. Please do not treat us and creative journalism as the last part of the pyramid because at the end of the day, most of the people you're supposed to be communicating to is the kind of journalism they are looking for. Just make sure it's professional. Andrew, Maiga, Kagwa, many thanks for being with us here on the Big Talk and honoring our invitation. You're welcome. Thank you very much uh, for our audience who has been part of this conversation. We return tomorrow, 9 to 11 in the morning. We speak about not creatives, but the politics of this country. <laughs> Good evening. <laughs>